going inside the issues of our community. This is Local 12 Newsmakers. What the leadership of both the Republican and Democratic parties uh, have done is recognize that we need to have the county commission focused uh, and our attention not diverted by hotly contested campaigns in the coming year, but instead focused on solving these issues in a way that represents the best thinking uh, and the best approach from all sides. Good morning and welcome to Local 12 Newsmakers. That was Todd Portoon putting the best possible spin on the deal struck by local Democratic and Republican Party leaders to eliminate active intense campaigns for the two Hamilton County Commission seats this fall. For over a century, the Commission has been firmly under the control of the Republican Party. Only one two-year period in the 1930s and a second time for a two-year period in the 1960s have the Democrats had two-to-one majorities on the Commission. Over the last century, it has been more common that all three seats were controlled by Republicans. But in recent years, races for county commission, think Todd Portoon versus Bob Bettinghouse or David Pepper versus Phil Heimlich or even the Republican primary fight four years ago between John Dallin and Pat DeWine, have been competitive, spirited, and here's an important point, expensive. Against that backdrop, the situation was triggered by the decision of Pat DeWine to run for judge, not commissioner. The Republicans then moved uh, Greg Hartman, the current county clerk of courts, over to uh, and who ran for secretary of state statewide last year and was defeated, ran, moved him over to the commission. The Democrats agreed not to run anyone for this technically open seat. Commissioner Todd Portoon will face opposition from Ed Rothenberg, but the Republican Party agreed not to endorse Mr. Rothenberg in an effort to give Mr. Portoon an open run. To discuss this strategy, I am joined this morning by Tim Burke, the president or chairman of the Hamilton County Democratic Party. I also invited George Vinson, the chair of the Hamilton County Republican Party, to be a guest this morning. Mr. Vinson declined, saying that it didn't serve serve any purpose to discuss this deal any further. Well, I don't agree. So Tim, welcome back to Newsmakers. Good morning, Dan. Um, so should we be referring to you as the new Boss Cox? <laughs> no, we should not. <laughs> but how long was this sort of arrangement being talked about and how much of it was Pat DeWine making the decision on his it, own. It happened literally in the 24 hours prior to the filing deadline. And part of the reason why it happened is because of the change with Pat DeWine moving off of the commission to run for judge, um, that changed the dynamics of this decision a great deal. Um, even when Pat DeWine was the likely candidate in the race, we didn't have any prominent big-name Democrats stepping forward to get into the race right now. Greg Harris probably would have run? Greg Harris would have run. There's no question about that. And Greg was ready to file. Uh, and Greg's a bright young guy who I think, even in a losing race for city council, really increased his standing mm -hmm. in the last election by demonstrating he really has a very good grasp on public issues and I think will ultimately be a terrific public office holder. But Greg, like any non-incumbent candidate, has struggled a great deal to try and raise the kind of money that you need for a serious race. And that was going to be the case in a race for the commission. But against Pat DeWine, we thought Greg had a decent shot. Or, at the very least, it would, by having Greg in during the primary, if he decided after the primary to get out, we would have the opportunity to You'd put have a replacement spot there. there. Correct. Now, realistically, Pat DeWine is probably weaker in that race than Greg Hartman is, that's, even though that's Pat DeWine was, a, was the incumbent. That's my point. Um, all the polls had indicated that Pat was weak. Um, we knew that there was a division even within the Republican Party about how they felt about Pat. When they moved, or Pat made the decision to move to the judicial race, and they put Hartman in, they put a much stronger candidate into that. It became a much more difficult race for us. Hartman is even somebody who draws from some of our base in organized labor um, that would make it even more difficult for Greg or anybody, uh, Greg Hartman, that, Greg Harris, that is, to run successfully. When you say Greg Hartman pulls support from some of your base in, in the labor union movement, mm -hmm. 
Meaning what? He pulls votes, he pulls money, he pulls endorsements. What? He's received both financial and endorsement support from some of organized labor in the past. Mm -hmm. And that's one of those things that complicated that race a good deal for us. So when presented with the opportunity from a Democratic Party standpoint of being able to help protect the Democratic majority and particularly to protect Todd, Frankly, it was a fairly easy decision for me to make. Um, and that's why I set it that. up that way, because it's good to remember that from a Democratic perspective, it's, it, this, would, this would be a first in over a century. Well, exactly. And Todd, as good of a campaigner as he is, as courageous of a politician as he is, he, just, he took a hit last November when the public safety, the jail issue, went down as big as it did, and that created some vulnerabilities. Who was, to, on, the on the Republican side, and I wish George was here, but he's not, who do you think was going to run, who were they going to put up against uh, Tracy Winkler, the Green Township trustee, and Winkler is a very strong name in Hamilton County, and I've learned that lesson the hard way by losing two Democratic incumbents, Judge Marianna Brown Bettman and Judge Jim Kenney, to Winklers in races that we thought we were going to win. Mm -hmm. So Winkler, even if people don't know her specifically, the name is a powerful it's a Republican. very powerful West Side family. So name. Todd, you felt you had to consider him vulnerable, even though he's an incumbent, even though he's and even though I think he would have won, but I can't. I, I thought Marianna Brown Batman was going to win too. Right. And this was an opportunity to do something historic, and that was preserve the Democratic majority. And at the same time, I think the point that Todd made in that opening tape that you showed is a very valid one. There are some really tough issues facing the county right now. And by giving them a breather and allowing Todd not to have to concentrate on going out and raising hundreds of thousands of dollars to do a campaign, they can focus on dealing with those county issues. The Cincinnati Enquirer, the only newspaper le daily newspaper left in town, is a old writer for the Post. I have to point that out. Uh, I know, they're in favor of competition in political races, but they canceled <laughs> the joint operating agreement <laughs> that created competition yeah, in the news media. It's done, it's over. Okay, uh, but th this past week they asked um, uh, readers to write in and comment on this, and a man by the name of Joe McKibben from Springfield Township begins his comment by saying, shenanigans like this point up the arrogance and corruption of the two-party system, which he then goes on and makes a plea for a third party, specifically mentions the libertarians, but just the, the idea of a third party movement. What do you say to that? Well, I, I, I don't know where they even get the suggestion of corruption. Um, political parties very often have to talk to one another, and, and that occurs on a regular basis. And sometimes it's like making sausage. It's not the kind of thing you want to watch happen but it is the kind of thing that is frequently necessary to encourage government to move forward. As you look out um, to the March primaries and then the fall general elections, and that's separated by a lot of time, March sure. to November. And I, I really hate this yeah, schedule. I do too, I just really don't like it. But be that as it may, are there any intense primary races for on the Democratic side on that you're looking at? On the Democratic side, there will be an intense primary race, there already is, in the second congressional district between uh, Dr. Victoria Wilson, who was our candidate two years ago, and Steve Black, who has recently become a Democrat um, and who is out there waging a very strong and serious campaign. And both of them, frankly, are good candidates. And one of those uh, names again that polls, uh, Steve Black's name, there, there are, there is some pull there. No question about it. His dad was a common pleas and court of appeals judge. His cousin Tim Black mm -hmm. was a Democratic uh, municipal court judge and two-time two candidate for the Ohio Supreme Court, and now a federal magistrate. So, pulls across those those Correct. party lines. Of course, on the Republican side, there's a very intense primary, uh, a three-way primary with uh, uh, the incumbent Gene Schmidt, uh, Tom Brinkman and Phil Heimlich, and that 
should be one that, well, we're all going to watch that no one. No question. Really I think everybody's going to be watching those two primaries. The Republicans also have primaries in a judicial race, and I believe it's in three of their state house races. Mm -hmm. So they've got some internal fights to watch as well. George isn't here. So anyway, let's move on. Look at the, d here you are, local head of the Democratic Party, the March primary is coming. We're all watching this past week what happened in New Hampshire, before that Iowa, uh, this coming week, mm -hmm. Michigan, well, not Michigan for the Democrats. Not for the but, Democrats. But, you know, focusing on South Carolina, all this excitement. What's the likelihood? What would have to happen for the Democratic primary March the 4th in Ohio to make any difference? The same thing that's happening so far, and that is a very hotly contested, relatively closely divided race. Because if what everybody is referring to as Super Duper Tuesday, when I think there are 20 states right. with primaries, if those states divide up, and I suspect right now that that's what's going to happen, if they divide up relatively easy, evenly, then the Democratic primary for President of the United States is not by any means over. And Ohio, all of a sudden, to the surprise of many prognosticators, becomes relevant. And frankly, it would be a, an absolute blast. Is it necessary, though, for that to remain a three-way race? I mean, my, my gut tells me if this comes down to a two-way race before the, the big Super Tuesday, if it's just Barack Obama and uh, Hillary Clinton, then it's pretty hard to imagine it going much beyond that. But if it remains Dan, I, a three-way race. I don't know. Even if it's, even if it's a two-way race, if they're neck and neck, and remember, these aren't winner-take-all primaries. The delegates right. get divided between them. Um, so you know, somebody can lose, but lose relatively closely, and still come away with a pocket full of delegates. Um, and that's what ultimately is going to determine whether or not this is over. If somebody gets to holding a majority of the Democratic delegates for the National Convention, then it is over. But I, right now, today, based on what happened in New Hampshire, I don't see that happening on Super Duper Tuesday. So what's happening locally right now among Democrats about getting organized to support various candidates? Is there activity going on? Yes, um, and that's been particularly true in the Obama camp uh, for a year now. They've been the most active grassroots operation, a lot of new energy. The, when we had our local delegate selection caucuses just last week, mm -hmm. the Clinton campaign was there in full strength as well. And actually in the second district, there were more people at the Clinton caucus than there were at the Obama caucus by a little bit. Um, so clearly there's a lot of energy gearing up. The Edwards folks had good showings at both caucuses as well. Um, I think we're down to the final three as we should be right now. And whether we're going to get down to the final two shortly or not is not at all clear. I think Edwards who has some good labor support, who has some good support mm -hmm. within the party base, is going to hang in there as long as possible. And he's getting enough votes to make him a player in this so far. Well, and I'm out of time, and I know that, but I, uh, even if he can't propel himself into being one of the two, he can put himself into a position where he can have a lot of influence on a lot of different things at the convention by just hanging in and keep continuing to get a certain number of no delegates. Question. It's, not just, it's not just about the top spot all I the agree. Time. It's a very exciting time. Tim, let's hope that we have a real Democratic primary on March the 4th because that would be, I think that would be important for Ohio and be really I agree. good. And if so, we'll get you back here. Thank you. Stay tuned after the break. This weekend, a very important local organization, Grassroots, Social Service Organization celebrates 30 years. If you don't have any money in the bank and something happens, well, you fall through the net. You have no safety net. 
This weekend, people who founded and supported the drop-in center in Over the Rhine mark 30 years of providing emergency shelter for people who find themselves homeless and facing life on the streets. It is impossible to think of the beginnings and development of the drop-in center apart from the most visible founder and spokesperson, Buddy Gray. For years, Buddy seemed to be everywhere, afflicting the comfortable to provide shelter for the uncomfortable. Although the public face of Buddy pr presented by the media focused on efforts to raise money to keep the drop-in open or fighting to save vacant buildings he hoped could be renovated for low-income housing, what often got overlooked was the very personal nature of the work Buddy did and that all the people at the drop-in center continues to do. I am joined this morning by two people who know not only about the institutional history of the drop-in center, but also the personal character of that work. Bonnie Newmeyer is one of the co-founders of the drop-in and a longtime companion of Buddy Gray. Donald Whitehead is a person who benefited from the services of the center when he was homeless and from the personal relationship he formed with Buddy Gray. Donald became the first homeless person ever elected president of the National Homeless Coalition and to serve as his executive director. Donald, welcome back. Bonnie, well, welcome you. to News, Newsmakers. Thank you for having us here. 30 years ago, what was it that sparked the founding of the drop-in center? What, what, what brought about the very beginnings of that, Bonnie? Well, it was actually 35 years that we were founded. It was in the summer of 1973, and a lot of people in our community were um, seeing homeless street alcoholics on the street. And I think that we were moved by compassion and needed to have a place for people to stay. And so there was an alcoholism task force that met and we decided we needed to have a shelter and in between time we were trying to sleep people in church basements that didn't go really well but buddy literally carried people up to his fourth floor apartment on uh, ray street um, 10 and we'd find mats on the floor and they'd be staying in his apartment but eventually brought a guy in from massachusetts bates ford and our first uh, drop-in center was a one-room storefront at 1711 vine street and then in 1974 we moved over to 1324 main street we had five rooms then, and that's when the staff at that time were thinking we couldn't keep the shelter open on weekends, but neighborhood people were saying, God, people will be dead if we don't have the shelter open seven days a week. So we organized ourselves into the Shelter House Volunteer Group, Inc. We kept that shelter open all weekends, and then eventually we took control you know, every day of the week. And that's when the landlord, we were living in conditions that were unsafe, plumbing, had cracked upstairs and it was a very cold winter. Icicles were back in this storeroom and we were overcrowded. And then the city was trying to close us down, saying, you know, community people, maybe they thought we weren't smart enough to run our own shelter. And just there was havoc funding. We were going to a battle for our funding. So we scout around secretly looking for a new place. And we started to negotiate with the Teamsters Union. So on a cold blizzardy Friday night we didn't know it was going to snow but we planned a midnight move and we felt it was a act of moral conscience that we had to get residents out of that place that was inhumane overcrowded unsafe to a bigger warm safe building like the Teamsters Union so January 13th 1978 is uh, 30 years ago is when the home for the homeless became, you know, the 217 West 12th Street site. So the 30 years is the opening of this particular site. At the site at the corner of 12th and Elm. Donald, you know, we, we could talk a lot about um, numbers, and we will here in a minute, or sure. homelessness in some amorphous way. But I tried to set this up and talk about the personal relationships that are built and that Buddy, and that was certainly important for you, your relationship with Buddy. Talk a little bit about the dynamics in a homeless shelter that go on, that go beyond just people coming in and sleeping. Well, um, it's really um, an amazing place. There, there's so much compassion inside the shelter. And for many people, myself included, we're people who um, on the street uh, were invisible. People didn't take the time to look us in the eye. They looked around us, they looked behind us, they looked through us, basically. And when you get to the shelter, people engage you, um, regardless of how you look. Um, how you smell. Um, people are there to greet you, uh, to hug you, uh, to tell you it's going to be okay. So there's there's a, a, a warm 
uh, nest of, of compassion inside that shelter. And the first day I got there, um, a buddy walked up to me. And again, I hadn't had anyone make eye contact, engage me in conversation for a long time. And I talked to Buddy for an hour. Um, and I don't remember any of what he said. I do remember, f except for four words. I remember Buddy saying, I'm glad you're here. Uh, and every time I got lonely, angry, tired, I wanted to leave, I didn't think I could make it, I remember those four words. Hmm. Um, and I also remember the many volunteers. I still have relationships with some of the people that came down to serve meals. And today you work uh, where? You um, I work on, uh, at two places, actually. Um, I work at uh, Goodwill, um, where we take people from the street who are homeless and we put them in permanent housing. Um, and then I also work at the Recovery Hotel. Um, I was actually the first resident there. Uh, so I'm trying to give back what was freely given to me. Um, I case manage the residents there who are uh, in recovery from substance abuse issues. Bonnie, uh, over 30 years, lots of things have changed mm -hmm. in terms of numbers and things, mm -hmm. go, things do go in cycles because of economic changes and whatever. Right. But looking at 30 years, the people who are served by the drop-in, are there, are there changes that go beyond just the ups and downs that you can see? It, have things changed? Uh, yes, I, the face of homelessness has changed. When we first started, it was a uh, middle-aged alcoholic person. And now the fastest growing population of homelessness is women and children. And the age is a lot younger. And so, you know, people, I mean, we get a, a certain amount of people that are struggling with chemical addiction and mental illness, but there's a, a big part also, we just don't have enough affordable housing in this city. So people can be working at day labor, trying to find money, you know, piece it together for an apartment, but oftentimes they don't have enough. So we have people that leave our shelter every morning going to work. That's sometimes people just think of a shelter as a flop house where people just don't care about anything. People that are, are living in our shelter have rich work histories mm -hmm. and they have rich heritage. So they could be you or I, you know, that's the thing that makes me upset that people try to separate us from the homeless and the non-homeless and as if they're, they're uh, derelicts or something, you know what I mean? But they're human beings just like you and, you and I are and they just need uh, some support systems and a lot of people I mean thousands of people over the years have come through our doors it's a place of uh, refuge it's a place of redemption because people are saying no to to drugs and alcohol and um, it's a healing place Donald on a personal level mm -hmm. uh, and you know I've known each other for a little while exactly. I know that you know your story is a story of, of coping with this and moving on yes um, for people who haven't been around the drop-in center or around homelessness, um, is there is there hope? Does, as Bonnie say, says, you know, people who come with rich work histories ultimately end up working again and being on their own and supporting themselves? Absolutely. Um, there's there's literally thousands of stories. Uh, mine is just one of thousands of stories. I, I, you know, I have people that I've worked with personally that are working on PhDs now, for instance. Um, many of the people that I went through the program with are actually at this point running programs themselves. Um, there's people who use their artistic talents. Uh, Jimmy Heath, who just passed recently, um, a longtime advocate and over the run, who used photography um, to to carry the message of people's redemption. Um, so people do um, transform their lives uh, after they leave the drop-in center. Um, there, uh, Bonnie talked about you know just the numbers. About 60% of the people uh, that are at the drop-in center work every day. They have some form of employment. Nationally, 40% of the people that are in homeless shelters work every day. Um, and people see it as a moral issue when, in fact, homelessness is an issue where the two biggest factors are the lack of affordable housing and poverty. Um, so there are moral issues, um, but they can't be addressed because people don't have places to live. Bonnie, you were mentioning before, um, you mentioned volunteers. Mm -hmm. What makes the drop-in center work? Is it, you know, what's the proportion of staff, volunteers, what's the budget? What, what, wow. what makes it work here? Well, I think it, what makes it work is that everybody is considered as equals and we come together. I mean, we've got residents who are part of the program, who are working on the soup line, helping do maintenance in the building. We've got volunteers from all across the city, area churches, civic groups, high school groups coming to help serve 
kitchen, and we only have a few uh, kitchen staff workers. And then there's just like, uh, uh, you know, there's a board, there's a, there's a mix. And we could not be where we're at today without people coming to our aid. And when you think 30 years ago, what's close to my heart too is we were on the news probably for a whole year like a soap opera, but people saw that it was the little people. We were just trying to do what we needed to do, and we were being pounced on by the power structure, so everybody came out of their doors to help us. Unions, the steel workers, electrical union, and they're still all behind us and supportive of us. And are you aware, are you saying that you think maybe you're not getting as much attention anymore and therefore not as much, many people coming out? Well, no, no, we got lots of people you coming out, but okay. what has been staying steady over the years is that you, some, our funding it gets cut off every once okay. in a while and things like that. We get lots of people. Well, unfortunately, I'm out of time. <laughs> I want to congratulate okay. uh, you on the, the longevity and the work. And I want to say that uh, Bonnie Newmeyer is contributing a lot of the papers of Buddy Gray and the movement to the museum mm -hmm. center so, so that they can be saved. Thank you for your work. Thank, Thank you, you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Next week, the leaders of Agenda 360, the effort to develop a countywide vision. Have a good week.